Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode four of our My Hero Academia review podcast. If you didn't know, each and every week, the two of us read through two volumes of the My Hero Academia manga, then sit down on this channel and review it. I am your host, Hoodie. That is my co-host, Zero, and this is Training Arc. If you're watching this as it goes up live on YouTube, then consider heading on over to patreon.com slash k2yt and pledging a couple bucks to get the next episode early. Of course, every episode we like to throw a question out there for you all to discuss. Last week, we asked you, whose quirk would make the best basketball player? Um, we might read some comments later on the show, I don't know. <laughs> this is a pretty dumb question. <laughs> this week, the question is, of the new generation, who should be the number one hero? Now, we just read, well, we read two volumes. The first volume was... Uh, mostly about the the stain arc or, or like the, the character of stain and the ripples he he's had through the uh ua students and obviously stain has pretty strong ideals about who who should be called a hero you know he very much praises a character like all might looks down on a character like ida and i guess by extension ingenium but you know if you have your own set of uh, thought processes on what makes a hero, you know, me and me and Zero a long, long time ago got into a lengthy discussion about the Civil War comics, and I think it was like we stayed up pretty much all night discussing the nature of what is and what isn't a hero. That's not necessarily applicable here, but you know, we have we have some strong ideas. Let us know your answer in the comments uh, down below. We'll give you our answers at the end of the video. Zero. We're through two volumes. I don't know the the chapter number. Can you give us a summary? of oh god i don't even is the first volume just the stain stuff or is that also the pra practical exams too uh i'm not entirely sure where it shifts i i feel like the stain stuff was mostly over in the last episode so i wouldn't be surprised if most of this was the hero camp Okay, no, the hero camp doesn't start until I, because I specifically, so here's the deal. I noticed when I was reading this week that um, these volumes, you know, they're really ending arbitrarily. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, the weird part is though, it's like, okay, so the, the problem is that it will end the volume like a chapter into the next arc, or maybe like two chapters into the next arc, which would be forgivable if it was like, Oh, each volume is exactly twenty chapters. But no, they're late. they're like yeah. Sometimes it's eighteen. Sometimes it's nineteen. Sometimes it's twenty. <laughs> and like, if you're having this variance, why are you just? Because I specifically did not read the last chapter of the of this volume because it was very clearly the beginning of uh, their training arc, uh, and I didn't you know I didn't want to just go one chapter into it. So I'm saving that for next week. This one was stain and then the practical exams so i don't know uh, if the practical exams is all the volume two but uh let's just go ahead and give them a brief summary of everything i guess so stain gets caught by three 14 year olds then he escapes to save deku and passes out from his own hype and literally nothing else uh, then <laughs> Todoroki finds a new name in Hand Crusher. I guess he feel he felt like Shoto wasn't descriptive enough. Um, Yoyo Rozo has a good moment. Uh, <laughs> Deku and Bakugo learn to contrib or learn to cooperate when their lives literally depend on it. Uh, <laughs> Mineta manages to pass even though uh, his partner fucking passed out. And I'm gonna take. I didn't originally put that on my notes, but let's. We could talk about the Mineta fight in a little bit, at some point, because <laughs> that, that 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 deserves some a little bit of discussion. Go ahead, keep going. I was glad they finally gave him something, but I I don't remember where all the kids end up. I think uh, Kaminari and the Alien Queen Lady both failed. I don't remember if... Um, um, Sugar Rush and Ki Kirishima both failed. Oh, right. Um, I think everyone else passed? Well, and then Sarah failed. class A, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, the last chapter goes into the training arc. I specifically, uh, I don't know how much further you read, but I specifically stopped there. I didn't, I didn't want to start. But, actually, this marks an interesting um, position for this, you know, series. Uh, I am officially done knowing what happens well okay uh, officially officially uh unofficially <laughs> um because technically i watched like the next two episodes of the show but this is like pretty much unmarked territory i, I really don't know like i i know some of the characters that are about to be introduced through the one episode or two episodes of, of the show i've seen but i don't know the resolutions to like that little 
weird boy and i don't know any of that any of what's gonna happen so after this episode of training arc i am almost a completely blind viewer so that's pretty exciting you know because actually cool. one of the things that you know is has become a, a recurring theme has been uh when i'm reading the manga it is hard for me not to be disappointed because of the anime comparison you know and that's why like so much I'll get this out of the way now. I very much liked the first volume. I, I'm, I'm sort of dividing it arbitrarily in my head. I like the ripples of the stain, um, like the stain arc, because it had less to do with action. You know, like the stain fight that we we got, like it was was over pretty quickly. And then after that, it was pretty much just people talking about like, man, isn't that crazy? You know, and then <laughs> basically, and then there was that scene in the mall with. Uh, Shigaraki. Yeah, Shigaraki and Deku, and like that was incredibly tense and not an action scene at all. So the recurring theme is that the more action I don't if if there's a ton of action, I don't really like the volume all that much. This one had less action, so I did like it a lot. But going forward, I'm gonna have less ability to compare it to the anime. So in return, I might be you know, it, it's fully possible that I still am disappointed, just because I know that in theory I know that it could be done really well in the anime, but it is entirely possible that after this, I start enjoying the action a little bit more, and thus the entire manga gets a little bit better. That would be really great. That would be great. I think you'll definitely start thinking, oh, I can't wait to see this fight in the anime, because that's what happened when I was reading the Naruto and Bleach mangas for the first time. I'm definitely, uh, I would hope so. I'm definitely going to need to like slow down. A lot of this was, you know, I, I sort of built up a fast pace because I am kind of, you know, <laughs> familiar with everything that's happened so far just by watching the anime so i was able to just sort of speed my way through these volumes but you know now going to the unmarked territory i am going to have to remind myself to slow down and really take in everything that's happening but one of the things that did happen in this volume that we didn't touch on in the summary was that the all for one one for all origin story was revealed what that's do you think true. of it um I guess we're given pretty vague detail here. Uh, I do like that, uh, you know, the in originator of One for All and All for One were brothers. Cause, yeah, very biblical. Yeah, got some Cain and Abel stuff going on there. And I thought it was interesting that uh, this power, like, no one has actually been able to beat one uh, all for all, all for one with one for all until All Might came around. It was like, listen, I'm the main character of an anime you've never even seen. <laughs> uh, except he didn't even beat him. So there's that. He beat him. He just didn't like capture him. Okay. Well, for all intents <laughs> and purposes, he's still out there acting. So I guess uh, I would call that an L for uh, for All Might. But I guess if you view it differently, hey, but... uh, so I, I my my opinion is probably a little different. I mean, I enjoyed it in theory, like um, not in theory. Um, like there were there were pieces of it that I very much enjoyed. If someone was pitching me this story that they wanted to tell, I would be like, "That's a great story. Tell it to me." But this was basically just All Might pitching the story to Deku, and I would have actually liked and. <laughs> I would have liked it a lot if one chapter was dedicated to actually seeing this story, like, happen. And I, I don't know like if there's, the like... Like the episode in Korra? Yeah. Like, that's actually a great example. I don't know if that's, like, there's logistical issues behind that. Like, I don't know if they just thought maybe the readers might be confused or if uh, they wanted to save it for later. But what we got right now was good. It was fine. I'm not like disappointed in it, not to a huge degree, but I think it could have been a lot better had we, you know, really just seen everything that happened because it just, I don't know, it kind of, the way it was told just felt a little weird in the sense of like, you know, yeah, his brother decided to just give him this power and, uh, you know, because he did. But, <laughs> no like, one really knows to, why it just happened. <laughs> because if we, if we got to see that, then maybe I would have been like, I don't know. Maybe it would have pulled a little more drama for me. It would have been a little more interesting, and I pro maybe by extension, I'd be I'd be a little more in, uh, invested into um, one for all. Not that I'm not. I mean, I I don't really know anything about him, but but this would have been a chance for me to have become invested into him. What do you think about that? I do think uh, it probably would have played a little stronger if it worked as like a flashback instead of um, basically a, a recap. For All Might, 
Um, yeah, even if it, maybe not even like a full chapter. Like I think a full chapter would have been good, but like even if we just got, I don't know, just more than what we did, I think would have been interesting. The um, just to go back for a second, the end of the stain fight, just on things that maybe were a little disappointing. When so we see Stain get captured, and then uh, you know Deku comes to. Oh, actually, just a quick note before I forget, did you see that the, at the end of the manga, the chapter that. Uh, Horikoshi was like, people have been asking why this Nomu singled out Deku, and then he said he just drew a he drew a character, and said this is a hint. Did you see that? Why does who single out Deku? A, one of the Nomu who who catches Deku. Oh. And then Stain kills the Nomu afterwards. Did you see at the end of the chapter, Horikoshi he drew this character, uh, and said it, it had the same wings that the Nomu did, implying that this character was tested on and made into a Nomu. And then that character, if you you know went back or if you just had a good memory, you you could recognize that character as being one of uh, Bakugo's bully friends. That uh, oh, shit. I guess by extension, Deku would have been friends with as they were kids. So that was just a very interesting thing that uh, Horikoshi just dropped at the end of a chapter that wasn't <laughs> like. Like, wasn't oh, at all expanded anywhere else. One of Deku's childhood friends was uh, basically turned into a monster by a s- supervillain. And yeah, we're just going to drop that here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, did, I couldn't figure out where to put this in the story, so I'll just uh, put it at the end, right here, on this last page. <laughs> yeah. Just randomly. That's what you anime-only folk, you don't get the inside scoop that we get from Horikoshi's notes. That's true. I, these the end of the chapter notes. I do enjoy a lot. I will, but it it does seem a little weird that like if, if this is an idea he had, I do think that is an interesting idea. I would have loved to have, you know, seen that talked about at all. Like just for Deku to <laughs> maybe notice or something. I don't know. It just that would that seems like a bit of a lost opportunity that I don't really know why he dropped that there. But I guess the the point I was making before I got sidetracked was that how do you feel about Stain dying? Because on one hand, I very much love the idea of Horikoshi not using this as a crutch. You know, I think when you when you hit when you strike gold, it's very easy to get comfortable and just stay there and just keep mining for that gold. And sometimes it works, you know, that you know, you don't want he, to just he, run he was away. More prioritized with the story he was telling between Deku and Shigaraki, which I think is um what's the word? Important? disciplined what do you mean like as you're saying i mean he could have switched over to making swing or staying a more lasting oh, character okay. but... you mean horikoshi is disciplined i thought you meant like the, that story was disciplined i didn't know what that meant but i get what you're saying so like yeah it, to me it seems like it is very much like he introduced this character it became incredibly like intriguing and easily one of the best characters we've been introduced to thus far and he just had the you know the discipline as you say to just say the his story what he needed to do has been accomplished it's time to kill him and move on i i very much love that he did that and i'm very impressed with his conviction and discipline to do that however do we think the way stain died felt a little like a cop-out because um you know, I'm, 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 I'm teetering on this. I don't 100% know. But the idea that he was, like, had this huge, huge, you know, killed the Nomu, saved Deku, is ready to fight everyone, punctured then, lung. Yeah. It <laughs> like, was a little underwhelming. <laughs> do, do we think... Do we think that speaks to something? Like, is that is and clearly it's intentional. There's no like he could Horikoshi could have just had him fight his way out and then die to the heroes if he really wanted to, but he decided to have him pa- have his lung punctured. Do we think that was a mistake, or do we think that is um, maybe lending itself to some sort of metaphor that we're just not picking up on yet? I don't know. I don't. I feel like usually when there's a metaphor I'm missing, I at least see like the bones of it. Whereas this, I don't know. Yeah, so like when we when we watched Kino's journey, a lot of that was like I'm not picking up what the message is, but there's definitely a message here. You know, yeah. there's too much lining up. This one, I don't know what the message would be about a punctured lung, but it to me it just seems so anticlimactic that it, it to me it, it seems like it has to be intentional. Otherwise, I don't really get why he would have just been like why he would have done that. You know, it just it seems because. I would have loved to see him fight his way out, you know? I would have been very (laughs) excited to see that fight. 
Um, I guess, well, personally, I feel like you probably wouldn't have gotten very far because Endeavor was there and, like, four other heroes, and he was already, you know, wounded, but... if in, Dude, if Endeavor kills him, that's fine with me. Like, I just, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't mind him being killed. I don't mind him being killed really fast. I just, uh, to the me, thing the is, punctured lung... Go ahead. I'm not sure if I should uh, spoil this because... Yeah, it could serve as a surprise for you later, but Stain's actually not dead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I should spoil this, so I will. <laughs> I, to be honest, I'm not sure why you assumed he was dead. Is he not? Uh, is it not like? Am I? Did I misread something? Was it not just like? I don't remember them saying he died. But what did they say then? Well, he just took a nap <laughs> <laughs> he definitely passed out and he did have the punctured lung but he was just unconscious oh well i guess well it, it, maybe the, maybe it's good that you spoiled me then because if it was if, if it was a misread on my part then it's not gonna play out like a surprise so unless it does i don't know but if, if it's just a misread on my part then i should know now just so i don't like get confused later on when stain just shows up and they don't explain anything and i'm just <laughs> like wait what just happened <laughs> so all right th thank you for clearing that up for me i thought stain just died so i guess all right so i guess i kind of see i guess okay what is sure i guess i'm on board now do we think <laughs> Do you think it was maybe a little scarier that it was, you know, he had this huge, well, one, I really loved, you know, I don't like talking about art too much just because it's not really in my wheelhouse of expertise at all, but I really love the way Stain is drawn every time he's on, um, on like page, you know, it's absolutely just, uh, it's so good. And he's, it is he's one of those characters where you're like, they get those wonderful close ups. You're like, damn, that's good art. <laughs> I think at the end of one of the chapters, Horikoshi was like, I drew him, you know, I drew his character design before, you know, I re and I didn't actually think about like, oh, I have to actually draw this a lot and have him move <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> so, you know, he really put a lot of effort into making this really cool character and maybe bit off more than he could chew. It worked out wonderfully, though. I, th I think Stain looked great. And in that last moment... He has this huge speech about, you know, and he, he does like claim he's going to just fight everyone. And um, maybe it, I, I was going to say maybe it, it kind of was intimidating to have him just die there because it, it left the sense of like, whoa, you know, what did just happen? And I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to come up with excuses for why this is a good thing. And I don't necessarily know if I have them, but I, I guess think, if they just wanted to. Go I ahead. do feel like that moment would have been pretty undercut if. It ended with Stain just getting captured by the heroes that were there. <laughs> yeah, I guess I don't see a world in which he does fight and then doesn't get killed. So if they wanted him alive for later, I guess it makes sense to just have his lung punctured and knock him out. That way they have no justification in killing him. So I guess, all right, with with the knowledge you have given me now, I'm, I'm willing to excuse it. In the moment when I, uh, when I guess I misread what happened, I was a little, a little smidge just a tiny smidge not a lot just a little <laughs> underwhelmed anyways that is uh the rough gist of all the stain stuff unless there's more you want to talk about on that note before we just jump into practical exams anything else uh i like that even though stain's evaluations of heroes like resonate with characters like acting on his philosophies actually hurt his goals more than it helped them because I'll say Ida was successful because Ida was clearly on the wrong path and that he talked to Stay that he was like, all right, I have a better idea of what a good hero is and now I'm going to try to be one. But he wanted to promote a hero revival and he ended up promoting a villain revival when his words went viral and everyone started flocking to the League of Villains, which he's like philosophically opposed to. And on that note, I guess... Introduction to what will be one of my favorite characters, already predicting it now, Toga. And, <laughs> hey. and you know, I'll give I'll give her side I'll give her you know friend some credit too. He looks really cool. I'm sure I'll love him. But Toga. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Uh, so all in all, Stain really great. I love I love this volume. You know, when I talk about the past couple volumes have been disappointing me a little bit, and just because they're so action heavy, this is where I I really feel like 
I don't want to say the manga can shine because I don't think it's doing anything that the anime couldn't do, but it's not being limited, you know, because because it is all just discussion based and, a, you know, a question of ideals. It's not, you know, it, it is, I think, I think manga at its strongest. So I, I'm very much a big fan of that volume. Moving on to the next volume, we get to the practical exams, which is basically just like their finals. All of the characters get split into two and have to fight a teacher. You know, just uh, All Might versus Bakugo and Deku. We <laughs> I got, wish we uh... did this at my high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would been that would have been fun. Uh, do we do we think that's like a, a really fair exam? Because even All Might, you know, All Might strapped down half his you know half his strength was still destroying these two people. I don't see a world in which anyone but Bakugo and Deku beat that guy. And yeah. even then, I don't even really see a world where they do. They just happen to. But <laughs> <laughs> so it, I, I don't. I get the. I get the reasoning. Like we need to give them more, um, you know, practical exams. <laughs> you know, more practical <laughs> experience, and the robots just aren't cutting it. But th- there's got to be a middle ground here of like, all right, no more robots. Now fight the number one hero. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> it does seem like a pretty big jump, and you know, clearly these kids aren't. Uh, up to snuff. Even though most of them do manage to pass, I feel like in pretty much all cases it was just the heroes kind of holding back a little bit. But well, they say they didn't. I mean, even they even um, you know we'll talk about Momo and Todoroki in a second. But Momo calls out Aizawa for holding back, and he 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 says, "No, I did not. This was my reasoning. This is why all that happened." Do you buy that, or do you think he was actually holding back? I mean, that's exactly what someone who is holding back, but <laughs> wants to give their students confidence, would say. So, and like, I don't think Deku's punch laid out all might long enough for him to carry Bakugo out the gate. You know, it's <clears throat> I maybe uh, I'm wearing my tinfoil hat here, but I do feel like most of them would have lost their matchups. Yeah, I'd be I'd be inclined to agree. I it did feel like even after Aizawa's explanation, I, it did make sense what he said. But I did still get the, you know, the hint that like, hey, you know, this was this was obviously a little held back and perhaps reasonably so. Quick note on Aizawa, though. You mentioned last week that uh, you think him and uh, you, you you read somewhere or whatever that him and Shinzo were uh, were doing up. some mentoring. Yeah. They did show that. They showed that in this chapter. We see. Well, they didn't like show it, show it, but we see. We saw uh, them walking down the hall together. Yeah, like a like a good old couple. So I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully, that get that gets expanded on. I do think that is a genuinely uh, interesting, you know, pair up. But let's talk about some of these exams. I wrote down Mineta and Saro because you you brought it up, and you know, it, I think it's some interesting discussion. Mineta, I didn't realize people hated him so much. I mean, I knew, you know, we we have some we have some friends who read the manga and they they talk about how they don't like him and i could see why some people wouldn't like him i didn't realize everyone didn't like him uh, because <laughs> i read some of the comments on this you know manga website and everyone's like i hate Man. mineta you know i want mineta dead just kill off That's this character all the comments already. See, read <laughs> so you know even even when they don't even show mineta in the chapter that's what they're all saying it's just it's <laughs> a high demand do you how do you feel about mineta just in general i will say uh I kind of don't like him, you know? It's that perverted anime humor that I've never really, um... <clears throat> Identified with? Yeah. And, I mean, some people will argue that he's got more going on. And I did like his showing in the practical exam. Like, I thought, okay, he used his power appropriately and managed to save the day, so... Well, okay, let's, let's break this down for a second. So... First, I want to say that, you, so you said there is more to the character, but I almost wish there wasn't more to the character, because I don't, I don't hate Mineta, but I do hate that, like, why I don't hate him is because he's a non-factor to me. You know, I very much view, um, I think a lot of people say they like or dislike a character, like a lot of casual viewers will say they like or dislike a character, just based on, like, do they want to hang out with this person? Are they, do they seem fun? And... And then another group of people, which I fall into, will say, do I like this character or do I dislike this character based on their impact on the narrative? And because Mineta doesn't have an impact on the narrative in almost any sense, I find myself being completely indifferent to him. However, 
when he does begin to have an impact on the narrative in some sense, when I see inklings of like, oh, they're trying to build him up a little bit, this is when I start to be like, okay, I don't like this guy. You know, because <laughs> stop, stop trying to make it happen. It's not going to happen. I don't want it. Cause You're that, not going to make us like Mineta. I don't care how good of a fucking manga cut you are. <laughs> uh, so the first thing, the first time this happened was, well, not the first time, but one of the times that happened recently was they showed him getting, he like placed ninth in their class on the test. And they were like, oh, he's actually kind of smart. And it's like, no, don't make him smart. Just make him dumb. I don't care. Like, just if I don't <laughs> make him dumb, make him a pervert, make him an idiot. I don't care. Just keep him out. I, like I don't want line, him to be the smart guy. I, I like the line. I think it was Kaminari. It was like, guys like you are only likable when they're dumb. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> and then, okay. Um, and then we, we talked a little bit about the, his showcasing the practical exam. That to me, that is the epitome of like, okay, the teachers were clearly holding back because Midnight had that one. I mean, she literally had the victory, and then yeah. she was like, "I feel like I feel like messing around with you," you know. And because she did that, <laughs> that opened up Mineta avail like a, a plan, a route of strategy to then get him and Sarah out. But you know, I don't even feel like when that happened that that plan was all that amazing. I mean. It, it was just yeah. it was kind of basic, and it just happened to work out, and he wins. So I I don't know. <laughs> to me, I don't I don't think Mineta's showcasing was um, surprising or impressive enough for me to care about him. And it was, but it did provide enough for me to have reason to dislike him. <laughs> that's that's my take on Mineta. And then on top of that, despite you know me not liking Mineta and me very much liking Saro, Saro fails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I don't even get the reasoning. I don't even because well, on one I think hand, he technically passes because he was teamed with Mineta, right? No, they they specify this. They say that even though his team passed because he didn't do anything, he failed. Wow, your but that's, tape boy lives to get upstaged. <laughs> but that is actually bullshit because we know that he did something. We know that he that's true. Covered... He saved Mineta um, from Midnight's initial attack. Yeah, that that was how Deku got into the school to begin with, was saving people. <laughs> and then Saro does it, and, and he, fails. he fails. Well, he doesn't have plot armor, so... <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the thing is, there was, there was no difference if they just let him pass, because there was no, like... Like, everyone got to go to the camp anyways, so why not just let Saro pass? Because I don't know why they got to do my man like that. Clearly, Horikoshi just hates him, and you. <laughs> they let him. They did let him win the race, though, which I yeah. thought was, you know, nice. They didn't show the race, but they Only did let him win it. Only because they didn't let Deku win. Yeah, that was basically it. It was like, well, <laughs> Deku would win, but we don't want him. We don't want the full cowling to be too good yet, so we'll just let Sarah win this one. Yeah, whatever. I'll take it. So other, uh, <laughs> other big practical exam was Deku and Bakugo working together. What do you think of that one? I thought they won in the most Deku and Bakugo way possible. Bakugo just banged his head against the wall, trying to be the best until he literally passed out, and then Deku just saved him. <laughs> that is an accurate summary of what happened. Do we... So, at, at the end there, you know, a lot of this was... You know, a lot of the beginning was them fighting each other, and most notably, like, in the literal sense, when Deku straight up knocks Bakugo out. <laughs> uh, which, actually, I actually like that moment a lot. Um, but towards Eventually the end... Eventually, you gotta knock Yubili out. It's a rite of passage. It's true. It's true. At the end, um, Bakugo is unconscious. Deku could go for the W, but he turns around and saves Deku, uh, saves Bakugo, and he still wins anyways. Do you think that was kind of um, dumb? <laughs> uh, well, what I like about the practical exams is that I feel like everybody, or rather all the teachers, are really thinking, all right, what are these students' weaknesses and how can I you know, try to help them overcome them. That's why I think Midnight, uh, that's why she went for that losing strategy as opposed to staying by the gate and just using her AoE. She seeks out Mineta and gives him a chance to win. And why, you know, Aiza was like, all right, they're forming a plan. I'm just going to stand behind this ice wall between them and the door and wait for whatever happens. And <clears throat> I think it goes a similar route in this case with uh, Deku and Bakugo. You know, All Might's like, well, if he saves his friend, that's a good hero thing. So I'm gonna let him do it. So it's like, it's like, um, you know, there there is no lesson being taught if I just kill you. You know, I I, exactly. I do need to let you get some sort of, you know, the the action of saving your friend is a good action, and thus I should not punish it. I can see it, that. Unless that's, you're that's Sarah. Real... 
<laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> even in this, even in this practical exam, Sarah is discriminated against when Bak- uh, when Deku is praised. Okay, whatever. The other, uh, the other practical exam that I think is of probably huge note is Momo and uh, Todoroki versus Aizawa. We talked about a little bit here and there, but what are your general thoughts on this? Because I actually, I actually do have some strong thoughts about how this all played out. Um, I like. Uh... Well, you know, we've sort of seen Yao, uh, Yao Yorozo's, um, like, what's the word? Inferiority complex start to grow throughout the uh, source of this uh, series, because I feel like uh, when we first saw her during the Heroes vs. Villain simulation game, uh, she seemed very competent, you know? She had a very solid analysis of what happened during the exam between... Uh, Deku and Ochako versus Bakugo and Ida, and since then, you know, she hasn't really... I mean, she's sort of been overshadowed by, you know, the big boys. (laughs) Yeah. I think her comparing herself specifically to Todoroki, who's literally, like, first in their class in everyone's mind, is kind of creating, or has created this unfortunate disparity in her like, perception of her abilities and what she's actually capable of, which is holding her back. And I like that, you know, Aizawa is, like... Well, not Aizawa, really. It's more like uh, Todoroki just like, all right, here, I have a plan, we're gonna do it. And then Aizawa is just like, well, your plan sucks, so I will beat you up. And then (laughs) Yao Yorozo... I especially like that Yao Yorozo was secretly working on her plan, even though she knew... She, or rather, she decided to just go with Todoroki's. Like, she was still making the flash bombs in the little Russian dolls. Because, like, well, what if we just need them anyway? <laughs> so that shows she has, like, deep down, she wanted to do her idea. Yeah. But she just sort of uh, rolled over for Todoroki's. Like, well, he's better than me. He's got to have a better plan. Until he doesn't. So, here's the thing. I think that's all true. And I think... There is a lot of potential there for a really interesting, great character. And I do think this was a good showcase of it. I do think, you know, last, uh, maybe not last episode, maybe two episodes ago, I talked about how Momo was a bit of a letdown and how we introdu- we're introduced to this character and we're expecting someone as Todoroki, we're expecting someone really cool, we're expecting someone who's really smart, really capable because they got in through this. They didn't have to take the exams. They were just, you know, invited. And I, and I talk about how she was let she was a letdown. You know, she comes in and she's super unsure of herself, and how, um, you know, she gets exploited by people like Mineta, and she any we don't really even get to see her do anything, and it, it's all just disappointing. And some people in the comment section were like, "That's the point of her character." I agree, that is the point of her character. I can tell that. I mean, obviously Horikoshi's not an idiot. I can see that he's planting seeds, but the problem was that in seventy chapters. Or not seventy chapters at that point, but in in like sixty chapters going into this, we never got to see that pay off in any significant way that made me think, "Hey, this is a good character." You can design a character intentionally however you want, but if that character design is bad, if you intentionally make the character bad, that character is still bad. You know, this is to as like a side a side tangent. A lot of people will, you know, specifically people we know will say that the Star Wars prequels, yeah. Anakin talks like a a loser you know he's really cringy and everything everything he says it makes you not like him and that's intentional okay it was intentional he intentionally wrote bad dialogue good for him it still sucks you know so that's kind of how I felt about Momo you know like yeah I totally see that he made this character like this on purpose and I don't like it and it's bad but I will say that this was there's nothing inherently wrong with the character it was just him um holding on to his cards yeah, they just weren't really, because someone was like, you know, someone in the comment section was like, hey, it's only been 35 chapters. Yeah, it's it's been 35 chapters. You know when I found, you know when I really liked Todoroki? The first panel he was introduced. You know, like, <laughs> that's all it took was one panel. And I will give him that not every panel can make, be amazing. Not every, you know, it, it might not be one panel that I love Momo, but it shouldn't be 35 chapters. It shouldn't be 70 chapters. So... I'm going to tap my head for Game of Thrones spoilers. We're going to talk about Game of Thrones Season 6. When I tap my head again, um, that is when we stop. All right, spoilers. Now, in Season 6, or maybe Season 5, Sansa Stark was 
becoming a very powerful character. You know, she was going through a lot of stuff with Joffrey and Cersei and, you know, her dad dying and being what she knows is like the only Stark left and sort of recovering from having been a victim of the game and the Game of Thrones. You know, she, she and she's starting to become a player. You know, she is like being manipulated by Littlefinger, sure, but, you know, her... She has a scene in Winterfell with this, you know, like slave girl where she says, the slave girl is like threatening her. And she says, I am in my home. You cannot scare me. And I'm like, that is a great scene. I love I love Sansa. You know, I didn't love her before. I love her now. And then that that scene was ruined um, or that Sansa's character had a really big misstep later on in season. I want to say like season six or maybe like late season five in which. Uh, she is married off to Ramsay Bolton, and in a really disgusting scene, really heart-wrenching scene, she is um, raped by him. And it is gruesome, and it's not fun, and I think it really took her character down a peg. You know, it really, really halted her progress in her arc. However, that, that was, that was, while that was a misstep, they recovered super hard in season six, or maybe season seven. I'm, I'm sorry, no, there's blending in my head. I binged them yeah. all, like, recently. <laughs> so... Uh, he, he, she she then has this scene with Littlefinger afterwards. Um, I think Ramsey Bolton um, trial was season seven. Yeah, but not. I'm not talking about that one yet. There's a different scene at, which I think makes it season six. Um, after Ramsey Bolton is dead, Sansa has a meeting with Littlefinger, where she confronts him about like you sold me off to the Boltons, and uh, he said Littlefinger says like I I had no idea what he'd do to you, and she's like what What do you think he did to me? And Littlefinger's like, I don't, you, I'm not, I don't want to say it. And she's like, what do you think he did to me? And she keeps nailing this back and forth. And she's like, she just keeps repeating this over and over again. And just making him, like, sort of shrink in his shell and become super uncomfortable. And then she has this huge monologue about, like, I could still feel him. You know, I could still, it, and it's just super empowering, super powerful speech. And I think Sansa has recovered and she's back on the right track and she's a good character again. But that doesn't, but my, I guess my question is, does the recovery make the um, initial misstep okay? Because I don't, uh, I'm going to tap my head so we can stop talking about uh, Game of Thrones now, but to, okay, tap my head. Back to My Hero Academia. I don't think, I think everything they did with Momo leading up to this exam was a mistake. I think they really mishandled, or Horikoshi really mishandled this character. But I think this one scene was recovery. I don't think it was as good as the Sansa recovery, but I think it was pretty good. Do we are we willing to forgive all of the initial, you know, missteps of Momo's characterization because it led to this good scene? What do you think? Um I guess well, uh someone I don't remember who, but I I recall someone saying in response to your criticism that it shouldn't take uh Horikoshi this long to uh, characterize uh, Yao Yorozo in an interesting way. Uh, and I sort of agree with that. I think the particular issue in this case, because obviously he can't get to everyone, he hasn't gotten to everyone yet, um, <clears throat> I think it's just the fact that y Yao Yorozo is, like, a character who's more in the spotlight than a lot of the other characters he's snubbed so far. Like, we've gotten moments for Ochako, Ida, uh, Kirishima, uh, not really Kirishima where we are. He comes later. Uh, Bakugo, obviously, Todoroki, obviously, and Deku, obviously. And Yao Yorozo is sort of, like, next on the list, but her moment comes way later than anyone else's. Like, Ida's moment comes in the first volume, when he becomes the class representative, uh, same goes for Todoroki and Bakugo when they, or rather, Todoroki, Deku, and Bakugo when they all have their um, uh, simulation uh, fights. And a the ton of thing. different things. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm trying to think of like the earliest example of like, dang, they got to do something cool. I think the yeah. earliest cool thing Yao Yorozo got to do was uh, destroy that zero points robot in the obstacle race. Which she did fairly easily, but it was like... Yeah, but, I mean, that that wasn't huge. I mean, that's, yeah, that was pretty cool, I guess. But it was also, like, surrounded by other cool things <clears throat> that, like, it's hard for me to really pinpoint that as, like, oh, yeah, that was great. Good job, Momo. And it's like, I could equally look towards anyone else doing anything in that race and be like, wow, they also did a cool thing. <laughs> exactly. And I feel like 
I don't know. Maybe he thinks Momo is a, a character that we'll pay less attention to than we are. Or... I'm not sure. I do feel like he's waiting too long to get into this character... Uh, like, this character's real motivations and arc. I want to see it, but it's not happening, you know? Yeah, I agree. Um, you mentioned Kirishima, and here's the big difference between these. Like, I don't, I don't expect everyone to be three-dimensional. You know, the fact of the matter is that, yeah, in a perfect, in a perfect story, every single panel builds beautifully and creates this symphonic, you know, orchestra of every character being amazing and showing insane level of depths with each word they say you know each each line that comes out of character's mouth just builds on them so immensely in a perfect world in a perfect story that's true i don't expect that i that's unreasonable to expect however i just i don't think it's too much to expect them to be as interesting like the ratio of interesting to screen time needs to be good you know like so i look at someone like kirishima who you mentioned who like doesn't you know kirishima where we are in the manga right now has not had anything that made me think this character is super deep or super interesting but he for the level of screen time that he gets i do think he is compelling enough you know like his 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 personality is interesting enough that for the couple of pages we get of him at a time he is perfectly satisfactory the problem is like you said that momo is in the spotlight more that momo was introduced as this character with an amazing quirk who was invited to the school who is on the level of todoroki who is supposed to be really smart and can lead people and she gets these moments of analyzing things and then all of that is you know all of this leads to a bunch of screen time and it's just not able to capture me as good. That those are, those are all my thoughts on Momo. Do you have anything else to say about it? Yeah. I can see where people are coming from when they say that she is supposed to be intentionally underwhelming. Like it's all supposed to lead to this arc where she you know, realizes her value and like comes into her own as a hero. But like Horikoshi, man, just pull the trigger, please. <laughs> yeah, really, just do it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know if you really wanted to make the argument that, like, you need to cut something out to make room for it. I don't like that argument. I've been, I've been against that argument in, like, a lot of my Avatar videos where I say, like, it only takes, a, like, a second, you know? Um, but if you really felt like you needed to... I don't think this is, like, the most succinct story in the world. You know, nothing, nothing stands out to me as, like, this should have been cut. But, like, I don't think, you know, I read every single page and I'm like, this was the most important thing in the world, and if they cut this out, the story wouldn't make sense. You know, like, I think <laughs> there is room. You know, like, you could make room here somewhere. Okay, that, yeah, that, that okay, enough of Mo. I'm, I'm done. I'm sure <laughs> this video, on. I'm going to get ripped apart uh, for this video. <laughs> all in all, before all the Momo we, fans. Before we, uh, do you want to do question of the week first, or you want to just do general thoughts on the volumes? Um, we can go into the question. All right, question of the week. After. Question of the week for this week. Let us know your uh, answer in the comment section below. Is of the new generation, who should be number one hero? Now, there's a lot of ways you could take this. You know, you could say, in my, you know, in my philosophy, my way of thinking a hero means a very specific thing and a character like bakugo is not a hero you could say that um you could be like stain and say that a character like endeavor is not a hero or i don't know how he feels about endeavor but a character like ida is not a hero i'm personally gonna take this a little more in terms of the narrative and what i think would be the most interesting just because that's you know kind of where i come from with a lot of things uh so when I say who should be the next hero or the next number one hero, I'm thinking like which at the end of the story or maybe not the end of the story, but flash forward a very distant time and everyone's out of school and everyone's a pro hero. Who do I think would make for the most interesting effect on the story? And I actually think I'm going to choose a cop out answer here because I I spent a lot of time thinking about this and I was going through all of the students and there, there are some people who I'm like, oh, maybe if Baku, you know, Deku getting number one hero might be a little bit boring, um, but it could be, you know, there's nothing. I don't think that's terrible. Bakugo could have some interesting effects. Todoroki obviously could have some interesting effects. I don't see a world where Ida could do it, but I could see Ida becoming a prominent hero like his brother being interesting. But ultimately, I'm going to choose the cop out answer here and I would like to see the hero system done away with you know like not i'd like heroes to still be a thing obviously but i'd like the ranking system to be gone you know i'd like a world mm. where 
um, you know, we do. I don't necessarily know if like we could just go Justice League with it or whatever. We good? Yeah. Okay. I I don't know necessarily necessarily if this is a world where we could just have like a Justice League of sorts. I do think there's a little bit of a disparity between you know like DC versus you know My Hero Academia universe that like may, it might make it feel a little out of place. But I I would like to see a world where we do get away with the hero system. It's, that's an interesting idea, and you know I feel like uh, in most of the superhero media we see. We don't really have something like the hero ranking system. I mean, it's the exact same system in One Punch... Well, not the exact same, but a very similar system in One Punch Man. But outside of the, these two shows, like I can't think of any superhero society where they're literally numerically ranked. <laughs> well, <laughs> one, of, one of the big things that, um, you know, is obviously a, a factor in this show is the... You know the the pop the popularity aspect of it, and it's also a factor in uh, One Punch Man is that uh, there are heroes that are just pining for popularity, and they don't actually care about saving people. To an extent, this is someone like Mountain or Mount Lady or what is that? Um, no, Midnight is a, okay. Uh, yeah, to an extent, this is someone like Mountain Lady, but also um, we saw that Momo's like uh, internship. She was also with someone like that. So, yeah. uh, and you know, Stain obviously talks about it. Oh, I don't know if he outright mentions it, but this is obviously someone he is thinking of what, what, who doesn't deserve to be a hero. Um, I don't think that is an, you know, I don't think that was a mistake to put this in the story. I think that is interesting. And I think it would be even more interesting to see how these heroes adapt to a new society where the hero system is gone. To see how someone, even like Ochako, who is a little more, um, you know, a little more uh, pure of heart with her intentions, she does want to become a a pro hero for money. Ultimately, you know, it's it's it's, it's good. True. It's 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 good that she wants to do it to save her family and all that. But it is it is for money. So when we do away with these, um, you know, material aspects of being a hero and just make it a system about being a good person and saving people, to see people like Ochako, you know, wrap their head around that, I think that would serve as an interesting avenue for the story to go. What about you? What do you think? Um, who do you, who do you think should be number one hero? Um. I think, okay, well, obviously Deku will be, and, you know, we're probably going to get a lot of comments saying Deku should be, but I'm going to go, you know, play a little devil's advocate, be a little biased. I'm going to say Bakugo, because I think, you know, we've seen a lot of the motivations for a lot of the characters in Class A, and obviously Deku, he wants to grow up and be All Might. Uh, Todoroki, he wants to uh, distance himself from his father and become a hero in his own right. Bakugo, er, Bakugo is the only one who's really said, I want to straight up surpass All Might. Which, I like that tenacious attitude, but also, you know, I think Bakugo has a lot of good instincts. He, we saw mm -hmm. um, during the uh, actually, I don't know if you saw this, but they were doing rescue training, and Bakugo, like, encountered this group of, like, slightly injured civilians, and he was like, you guys are okay, move on. Of course, he said it more rudely, but that was the correct answer. Like, you're supposed to prioritize saving people who can't save themselves. And I think, in a way, that, uh, also ties in, or, that instinctual talent for heroism also ties into Bakugo's goals. Like, he wants to be the very best. Even better than All Might. I think that will... Because, you know, the series has sort of uh, suggested this theme before, you know, people who shoot for the stars versus people who don't, there's a clear difference yeah. in where they end up. And I think that'll play a role in Bakugo's development as a hero. I, obviously, he has some personality issues, let's call them. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point. Who do, you, who do you think Bakugo is as a character when he would hit that point? Because, you know, imagine a society where Bakugo, as we know him now, is the number one hero. That is 
where every little boy or you know little boy and girl is looking up to Bakugo as like who they want to be and it's this guy who's like yelling at everyone and wants to beat people up all the time and it's like you know that is a a weird society to live in so you know but at the same time I don't think that necessarily would be who Bakugo is when he gets to that point so what do you what do you think Bakugo would be like when he is number one hero do you think he is a lot tamer do you think he's like completely 180 and he's like he's like all might or whatever I'm sure he'll never quite get that far, but, you know, I I think, obviously, he can't be the exact same person that he is now and be the number one hero, even though that would be extremely entertaining, but in terms of how much he'll actually change, I think one thing Bakugo is missing that Deku obviously exemplifies is the desire to save people as a hero. For Bakugo, he sort of just wants to be the best, which means standing above all the other heroes and all villains, which, you know, is good enough, kind of, but not really. I think he's going to need to learn to sort of value other people more than he does. Maybe this maybe this exact volume was a good step towards that then, because he, you know, not... Not as outright as it will be, but he does learn to work with Deku. You know, he he does learn that, like, he can't just solo All Might and that, you know, that's going to be the answer to his solution all the time is that, you know, sometimes he does need to work with someone he hates and does need to value what they bring to the table. And that's always been, like, a steady progression of his characters, like, learning to value the, his peers and how they actually do, you know, yeah. provide of, of sorts. All right, anything else on the question of the week? I do think uh, your suggestion of doing away with a hero society, or rather with a hero ranking system, is would be pretty interesting. And I don't know, maybe that is sort of where Horikoshi's going. It would be sort of like Stain's wet dream, you know? Like, oh, thank God they finally got rid of that shit. I think it's gonna. If it is, it it depends. If that happens, or rather, whether or not that happens is probably going to depend a lot on where this story ends. If this story ends early on after them graduating, then I think it will probably end in a more, like, Deku just gets number one hero type of way, because, you know, that's just a little more satisfactory. But if we go beyond that, you know, plus ultra, then I think... (laughs) uh, (laughs) Then I think we... There is a, a genuine possibility that the hero system is abolished, because I do think that provides a very interesting turn. And I do think a world where Deku is just number one hero is kind of boring, you know? Unless, you know, that is just the end. Yeah, it's pretty predictable. Which, the show is called My Hero Academia, which a lot of people have used as a sign to point towards the series ending when they graduate. Which, I don't know, I think they could just change the name or something. (laughs) Uh, I, I do think there. it's not like a Naruto thing, though, where they could just, like, change a word or add a word, though, because, well, I guess My Hero and then just change Academia. But the problem is, so my, my original thought was just going to be, like, so much of that title is linked to school that if you just gave it a completely new name, I think that's, like, a bad business decision. But could you just know, be just My Hero Career. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't know what the exact word is going to be. Probably not that one. But yeah. I, I do think they could change it a little bit. I, I honestly don't know. I don't know enough about like the culture around these, you know, manga and shonen jump, and I don't I don't the know enough about how the fact that it's a long running shonen like sort of suggests to me that it probably won't end there. But then again, we've seen like main uh, shonen jump shows like have this idea of this is where our story ends, so we're ending it here. Obviously, that happened with Death Note. Shut up. <laughs> uh, what about is is Kiriko Shonen Jump? I actually do not know at all. Okay. Haikyuu well, is. Yeah, but Haikyuu is still going. So, and who knows? I don't know when that's gonna end. I, I would love a world where this is a tangent. I would love a world where Haikyuu. So I was um I watched Ace of Diamond not a lot, but I I watched like a little bit of Ace of Diamond a long time ago. And in that show, the first um I don't know if it's just two seasons, but like the first part of the show is about the guy as a first year, and then the second part of the show. You know, once that story is finished, they fast forward to him as a third year teaching the new year, the new first years. So I would love if Haikyuu went in a, went in a way like that because I do think it would be weird if we just kept going, even though you know we have people like Daichi and Sugawara just leaving. But uh, I would love the story to continue if they could figure out a way to do it. Uh, that's 
for our high Q training arc. <laughs> this is my academia. <laughs> that is the question of the week. Again, it was of the new generation. Who should be number one hero? Leave your comment. Uh, leave your answer to the question in the comment section below, and we'll read the ones that we like. That we like. Jesus. If you can't tell, I'm, I'm a little sick and uh, <laughs> I'm really tired. Uh, of, we'll read the ones that we like next week. All in all, thoughts on the last two volumes. What do you think? Pretty good stuff. I'm not sure if uh, I feel the same way I did last week, where I was saying it, it just gets better every volume. You know, I actually wrote that down specifically. I said, Zero liked each new chapter the best. Does that continue to hold true? I didn't I didn't ask it, but I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> it's Like you said, this volume does uh, slow down a little bit, or slow down a little bit. These volumes, I should say. But... <clears throat> I like I it that. I like it that way, though. Yeah. I guess I just like uh, the high-stakes moments, you know? The high-intensity, like, dang, is Tane gonna fucking kill everybody? Or what, what's going on here? Even though, you know, I've read all this stuff before. Okay, so... But you, I assume you liked it, right? You didn't dislike the chapters, or the volumes. Well, yeah. I mean... I'd say these are probably up there, in terms of... Uh, what we've covered so far because the plot is moving forward which is what i really appreciate about reading a manga you know seeing where it all goes so um i want to ask you which one you like better the practical exams or the like the ripples from the stain arc um but you know my thoughts are that i i very much enjoyed the stain stuff um i thought the practical exam stuff was you know, equivalent to the tournament arc where it was just like, this isn't bad, but I don't really like all the action and stuff. Um, so for me, the interesting comparison would be Stain to uh, the Stain arc compared to like the first volume, because that, excuse me, that is like um, the benchmark for me for what I like about this manga was, or how much I can like this manga was the first volume. I very much felt like um, there's, there's a sort of magic to this series a little bit of charm that's pulled me in because that you know that first volume didn't have a lot of action it was just the character of Deku and him realizing that he can be a hero and all of the emotion that went with that that was really touching yeah. um so it, the question is is to me is stain or is the stain arc as good as that first volume and i don't know because i think they they appeal on two very different ways you know the subconscious way we re react to art very much, you know, this is like when you watch a movie, are you sad? Are you happy? You know, are you scared? The very subconscious primal way we react to art, that is how I felt about um, volume one, where it was like, I read this, I am sad. You know, I am happy. <laughs> um, as to where the stain stuff, it's not like it, it, not, it didn't draw in my emotions like that. It didn't like rip into my heart and, you know, blah, 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 idioms, phrases, whatever. Um, but what it did was appeal to a different way in which we perceive and react to art, which is like as thought pieces, you know, as yeah. something to reflect on yourself about and society. And that's something very strong. I think that's very important. And I think both of these are important, and they're, but they're not necessarily equatable. So I don't necessarily know which one I enjoyed more. Um, I would probably enjoy rereading the first volume more, but there's, there's something important and special about something like the Stain Arc that I just, I, I can't quite make that choice. So I don't, I don't know. Uh, what do you think about that? But also between this one, uh, the Stain Arc and the practical exams, which one did you like more? Uh, I think you, you brought up the, these two interesting elements like uh, the sort of heart-wrenching element of the manga versus the, uh, what did you say? Like thought-provoking, or I don't, I don't know what I yeah, said. Yeah, <laughs> that's the gist. Um, I feel like you know the latter of those two probably uh, like gets me a little more because I, you know, like to think about stuff. <laughs> yeah, as we all do, as we all do. <laughs> yeah. So that might be why I enjoy the Stain arc so much. In comparing and contrasting these last two volumes we read and the two volumes that preceded them, uh, the Stain arc was sort of cut in half by that. And I think what I liked more about the uh, two previous volumes was the, the progression we get from Deku, which we don't necessarily see so much of in these two volumes, in terms of like his powers actually progressing. 
we do sort of get some character development in his uh, practical exam. But I also feel like the practical exams are where I, or as I described earlier, where it starts to slow down a little bit. And, you know, we're going to get back into the good stuff in the next volume, I believe. And to So to answer your follow-up question, I think the Ripple of Stains, uh, you know, uh, capture or whatever when the League of Villains starts to grow and Shigaraki uh, encounters Deku in the mall, those are great moments. I really like them. I really like the League of Villains in general, actually. Got a whole video coming out about that stuff. Uh, but <clears throat> there was something I noticed in both sets, like the, the two volumes we just read and the two volumes that preceded them. Uh, Horikoshi uses an interesting instrument he uses, like, texts and lines that don't have to be spoken, which obviously, you know, works better in manga than it does in anime. It, which, you know, some anime gets criticized for having heavy narration or heavy flashbacks. I think that might be due to the ability of anime, or rather of manga, which is then adapted into anime, to just put, like, text on the page that uh, obviously relates to what's actually happening let me give some examples. Do you have an example? Okay. <laughs> I first noticed this when, uh, during the Stain fight, when Ida realized that his priorities were misaligned and he should have focused more on saving people than on revenge as a hero by thinking about what he said when he showed up on the scene versus his more uh, heroic contemporaries in Deku, Go in Deku and Todoroki. Like, oh, they both... Like, it literally just uh, uses the phrases they said, puts them on the page in the middle of the action, and is, like, reinforcing the themes. It was like, uh, what, both so of them my, saying, I'll save you, and him saying, I get, I'll kill you, or whatever. I get what you're saying. Um, my question would be, in the anime, and I don't know this, this is a genuine question, in the anime, could, would, or could they and did they just recreate that effect by having the audio of those lines said? You know, like, um, you know, in my high cue video that I, the music video that I just put out, uh, there are times where I have something on screen and then audio from a different scene playing over that one. Right. Uh, I don't know if they did it in that scene, but the second time I noticed this, which was in these two volumes, was uh, when Gran Torino sent off Deku after his internship, he had a line about how he wants All Might in his, old in his old age to be able to see Deku's name hailed as the symbol of peace. And because you have to... Or this is in the middle of a conversation. And because to recreate this, you have to dedicate like audio in the anime, this couldn't happen in the middle of a conversation. So that thought mm. was just cut from the show. Oh, interesting. Okay. That is an interesting thing. And you, you confirmed that that is like actually just cut out of the show? Yeah, I rewatched the scene. Huh. That is an interesting observation. How did this uh, stretch back to the point about which volume I liked more? <laughs> that was an interesting <laughs> point. But I'm just, I, where did we, how did we get here? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I sort of just started talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, great point. Great point. I, I very much thank you for, for saying that. Uh, but I guess... Uh, to go back to the question, though, <laughs> which volume did you like more? <laughs> um, so between the stain stuff, uh, the stain fallout, and the practical exams, uh, I think it was because I was talking about the stain, the stain stuff, which is where the first example came in. But, okay. Uh, I mean, I got to give it to the stain stuff, right? Like the practical exam, we got a uh, great development and you know some great teaching moments from characters like mid or like Aizawa and All Might obviously and that's nice but the League of Villains and uh Stain's encounter with uh well, well first off when he saved Deku from that uh Nomu it's just it's all so good I love it uh, yeah <laughs> really great all right all in all Stain great character love him a lot good volume good show good manga <laughs> that's gonna do it for this week's episode of training arc if you're watching this on youtube head on over to patreon.com slash kdoit and consider pledging to get the next episode on monday otherwise we will see you in a week with the next two volumes of my hero academia we actually might 
you know, I, I, just throwing this at the end here, I might be a little more specific about how I'm cutting these up just because of the way these volumes are so arbitrarily divided, but uh, I'll have to put some thought into that. So we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for watching. Bye.